The order that we live in, that we take for granted, is fragile. And it can just disappear overnight. As people in France learned uh, after 1789, you can wake up one day and it's gone. And then you are in desperate condition. Um, and I hope we don't get that far. Um, it would be a wonderful thing if there was an insurgency within the Democratic Party against the craziness. Professor Paul Ray is Professor of History at Hillsdale College in Michigan. After studying at Wadham College in Oxford on a Rhodes Scholarship, he completed a PhD in Ancient History at Yale and has taught in a, quite a range of universities across America in the years since. In 2009, he wrote a book called Soft Despotism, Democracy's Drift, which considered or generated a lot of pretty considered and sometimes heated debate. As well as writing very important books and articles, he's a well-known and considered commentator on modern society and politics. He brings uh, an immense grasp of history and politics to bear on our current circumstances. Paul, thank you so very much for joining us today. Your reputation as a historian is absolutely superb and having read some of your work I can understand why. Um, can I begin by saying does the state of education and particularly the teaching of history in the West in general but in your country in particular have something powerful to say about the way in which we now seem to be ignorant of the lessons of history? Hmm. Well, I don't think that I could assert generally that those who teach history in our institutions of higher learning uh, are apt to address those questions. Uh, there's been a generational change. And I think politics and maybe culture as well are generational. And there's been a move away from thinking seriously uh, as historians from about uh, military affairs that died out quite some time ago almost nowhere in the United States is military history taught uh, diplomatic histories disappeared too uh, many many uh, institutions during Vietnam had diplomatic historians rather than military historians now they have neither economic historians there's next to no one teaching economic history in the United States. And the last thing that's dying out is political history. Uh, now, one consequence of this is uh, history majors have declined radically. Because if you do not talk about things that people care about, no one's going to come. And so um, just as literature departments are losing their way in the United States and losing their clientele, so history departments uh, have begun to lose their clientele. Now, I don't encounter this directly because I teach at an oasis. Uh, I teach at Hillsdale College, and sometimes people ask me, what's it like? And I say, Williams College, 1955 with girls. And I can add, and with African-Americans, because this was an abolitionist college, and it has always been open to African-Americans. Um, but we have a curriculum that's very similar to what the curriculum would have been like in 1955. And uh, the, the consequence is I only encounter this when I go to conferences or when I meet with students from other universities. Now, I've been here for 15 years. And in those 15 years, there's been a transformation. And the transformation is largely generational. Uh, and what I would say about what's happened in the academy, 
starting in literature, moving into history, and who knows where else it will go, is the driving force is nihilism. There is a kind of hatred of the inherited order without any notion of something to put in its place. For all that was wrong with communism, they had an idea of what they wanted to put in its place. Now, what they did put in its place was a monstrosity, uh, and it involved the deaths of hundreds of millions of people. Um, now what we have is simply hatred of the inherited order. And the problem with that is though the inherited order is anything but perfect, it's by historical standards awfully good. I mean, if you take the situation in the United States, this is a country where um, ordinary people live very well. And they live very well because of natural resources, of course, but also of good public policy with regarding economic matters, good public policy with regard to political matters. And the key thing in, with regard to, to, to um, political matters is that not be too difficult for there to be a redress of grievances, if I may use the old yeah. English, English phrase, yep. which is to say, uh, from time to time, ordinary people have an opportunity uh, to judge those who rule them, and it's a real opportunity. And what you, prior to the current period, what you uh, saw in American history is a moving back and forth between two separate political elites, two major political parties, in which uh, throwing the rascals out, as we Americans sometimes say, was very commonplace. Uh, and the consequence is you had a public policy that was extremely responsive to felt public needs. Yep. Now, I won't argue that this was always perfectly rational. In fact, surely it was not always perfectly rational. But it was more rational than you would get if you would get an, uh, a political party that is firmly ensconced in power and can't be moved out of power. Uh, so the, the, the inherited system um, articulated under the Constitution uh, that was uh, framed in the late 18th century, adjusted in modest ways subsequent to that time, has served us very well. And what we're looking at is an attempt to overthrow that system by um, breaking all of the rules that are not written into law all the unwritten rules, the mores and manners that govern the way uh, the majority party and the minority party operate towards one another in the House of Representatives and in the United States Senate, uh, the unwritten rules about how you conduct yourself in elections, uh, the written rules about how you conduct those elections. All this is being overturned in the interests of getting a kind of monopoly of power and those who are desperately seeking this monopoly of power know what they want to get rid of, but they have no idea what they want to put in its place. There really isn't a kind of positive program. Uh, and so there's going to be tremendous conflict. Um, for example, I mean, one of the elements of this is to force everybody back into living in cities. People don't want to live in cities. Uh, and the cities are becoming a nightmarish place to live. If you defund the police and force people to live in the cities, it's going to be a Hobbesian nightmare in which life is going to be nasty, brutish, and short. Uh, and you can, you can see the resistance to this because demographically, there's been a tremendous decline in our cities. Chicago has fewer people living in the city limits than they did in 1920. Really? Yes, uh, and uh, the, in, in New York City, it's fewer than lived there in 1950. There's hardly a place outside the Sun Belt where there hasn't been a major move out of the cities. 
to the suburbs, but also to other places. Uh, and the reason is people like to live in circumstances where they feel safe, where the schools are tolerably good. You can just go down the list. And now, if you notice, I'm talking about bourgeois life. Who cares about schools if they don't have children? Uh, and uh, who cares about children? And that's people who are actually married and stay married. Uh, they're the people who are abandoning the cities. Uh, and I don't see, I think Chicago is going to go the way of Detroit, you know, which is a black hole. Yes. Uh, and think about Detroit as an example of this. In 1950, Detroit was the wealthiest city in the United States per capita. The wealthiest. The motor car industry. Yes. Good jobs. And then uh, it declined somewhat by 1968. You had the riots in 1968. And the riots never ended. I mean, there's a sense in which the riots took place in 1968. And then you had crime on a grand scale and just continuing. Uh, the automobile industry, what remained of it in 1968, moved out. There's not a single automobile in the United States made in Detroit now. Uh, and people moved out. Uh, and then it became completely unlivable. You know, if you go there and you were to tour Detroit, what you'll see is ruined buildings, beautiful churches with everything collapsed inside. Uh, the, the, the Guardian in Britain did a, a, a photographic essay of, of this about, oh, 12 years ago. It's just breathtaking. It looks as if Detroit had been bombed, but it wasn't. So you can, you can destroy civilization. And that was done there. And there's a move in that direction now. Uh, and it extends into changing the curricula mm -hmm of grade schools, junior high schools, and high schools. The curricula of universities has already been changed. Um, and the hiring and the curricula patterns. curricula the university then filters back into the education system. Yes, oh yeah, it starts at the top and it works and its way down. It starts down. in kindergarten, it's people don't overlook that, but it's the basis of learning starts in the right. kindergartens. It does, and um, uh, the, the, you know, there are other, things that have developed that have influenced this. The post-World War II mobility made divorce easy. When in my father's gen, my father was born in 1902. In his generation, if you worked at Gulf Oil Company, which is where he worked, and you abandoned your wife for a floozy, you'd be fired. And the reason is the wives of everyone else in the business would not tolerate yeah what you had done, and their husbands were obedient. Um, uh, it's not like that now. Let's, you're painting a picture really of, and I think this is common, it's not just America of course, a strange situation where the elites, who are the great beneficiaries, sure. educationally, living standards, opportunity to travel, send their kids to good schools, who now loathe, their own culture, yes. their own home. And one subset of that that seems to be very significant because of course the elites have money and they have wealth is that there was a time when corporate America, when the business community created the jobs, created the wealth, made America the home of opportunity, the global leader that it was, but corporate America and the tech leaders and bosses now are amongst the most critical of our society and they have the capacity to resource people who are wanting to reinvent it in their pursuit of power. And they're doing it. On, Big time. Yes, on a, on a very grand scale. Um, there was a book published a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago, called Coming Apart. Mm -hmm. um, and the, it, it, it looked at white America only. Uh, to avoid controversy, I think. Uh, and the theme was there really were two Americas developing. Uh, one, uh, which one would have said would have been the lower middle class. Um, 
and which was the backbone of the country when I was growing up. Uh, and they were the people least likely to divorce, to abandon their children. They lived on the edge of not starvation, but they lived in tight circumstances and they were extremely disciplined. All that discipline's gone now. Uh, and the family breakdown is just astonishing. Uh, then there's the sort of middle to upper middle class. They marry late, but they marry and stay married. They don't have any argument about fidelity, about family, or any of that, but they behave in that way. One other dimension of what you're talking about is the elite stretching down into the majority of people who went to college has a kind of seething contempt for the people who are not in the elite. Um, I first noticed this when Obama first ran for the presidency. He made a comment about those who clutch their guns and Bibles, and it was a kind of patronizing. When Hillary Clinton ran, uh, I was not very happy with Donald Trump. Too vulgar, uh, it seemed to me to be cruel. I almost voted for Hillary Clinton, but there was a point when she talked about the kind of people that um, weren't with her as deplorables yes. and irredeemables, and it was the irredeemable part that bothered me. That's Protestant theological language for those who need to be cast into the outer darkness. I listened to that and I thought, I wonder if they're going to have re-education camps next. Um, and step by step, that kind of rhetoric of contempt for people who aren't on your side has become standard. We now have a president who talks about uh, people who voted for Donald Trump as fascists. I mean, it's, it's simply remarkable. Uh, and um, when you talk about people that way, they get angry and they stay angry. Uh, furthermore, you are teaching the followers of your party how they should treat the people they come into contact with who are of that sort. Uh, that is to say, uh, who are sympathetic to Donald Trump. Um, the neoliberal global order the rules-based international yeah. order, which became a kind of universal order after the Cold War, mm -hmm. for a while anyway, um, produced enormous wealth yes. uh, in this country. And it led to the emergence of this particular class that thinks of itself as righteous. Um, you know, it's as if the old Puritanism has returned in a new form the same intrusiveness, the same self-righteousness, uh, and a propensity for treating ordinary folks, plumbers, electricians, small businessmen, with a kind of seething contempt. I've not seen this before in American life. Uh, uh, those in positions of responsibility if they had such opinions about their fellow citizens, kept them to themselves. Um, if, if someone in the 1970s had referred to those who supported another political party, one of the two major political parties in this country as fascist, that would have been the end of that person's career. Yeah. It would have been over. The people in their own party would have destroyed them. Mm. Uh, so there's something that has happened and the people who have profited most from this rules-based order are the ones who are most hostile to this rules-based order. What an irony. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's, um, and again, I think it's generational. I grew up in the wake of World War II. I was born in 1948. And um, patriotism and a pride in American institutions was the common coin of the realm. And with some reason, we had come through the first two world wars 
rather well. And we were caught up in the Cold War and we weren't doing perfectly well, but we were doing tolerably well. And that managed actually to last until about 1980, maybe 1988. Uh, the end of the Cold War marked the beginning of a sea change in American life. I don't think it became visible until the Obama administration. Uh, and I don't quite know how it will end. Um, in Britain, they have, there's a phrase that gets used for certain periods of time between elections called the silly season. Yes. Okay. The United States is going through an elongated silly season in which one of our political parties thinks the real problem in American life is that biological males can't use women's bathrooms. Uh, and they want to shove that down people's throats. Uh, and all of the sort of uh, people in charge of the culture, Netflix, Amazon Prime, and so forth, they're trying to make propaganda films and TV series pushing this kind of thing. It's getting very hard to find a good movie. Uh, yes. Now, the effect of it is no one's watching this stuff. Um, I mean, what they don't understand... Well, Netflix is certainly discovering that. Yes, they are. Uh, and Amazon Prime as well. They're canceling series that they thought would be the thing. Mm -hmm. um, one dimension of this that may be true is our upper middle class lives in a bubble. They don't actually know people uh, who think otherwise. And um, I'll give you an example of this. When Trump was elected, the New York Times sent a reporter to Hillsdale College on an anthropological expedition to, you know, look at the natives. Um, and he was shocked because uh, he was an older guy, had been their uh, Beijing uh, uh, station chief at one stage. And he discovered what we were teaching was what he was taught when he was in college. The New Yorker just sent someone here. Um, whom I met with last week. Well, again, she's essentially been sent here on an anthropological expedition. And I think she was similarly shocked because, you know, if you live in the Beltway between Washington and Boston and uh, don't go out into the world, you don't meet anybody that um, is upset with the kind of direction that they want to go. And there really is no understanding of it. But there's a subversion of institutions. Look, sending the FBI to raid the home of a former president would have been unthinkable in the past. Uh, and uh, that it, it's simply done now is remarkable. You're a historian. Doesn't this absolutely just evidence the truth of the old adage that those who don't learn their history are destined to repeat it. I mean, as a historian, surely you despair that, that, that all of these elites are so unaware of the lessons of history that they are actually repeating it. Pro well, provoking differences, treating people with sarcasm, the Marie Antoinette line, let them eat cake. Right. Have they learnt nothing from history? Well, or is history simply not taught? It's not really taught. I mean, I know we're and, repeating. And they ground. haven't they haven't studied. But, but look, I think we've had the neoliberal order for thirty years. Yeah. Um, there is a propensity to suppose that the world that we live in will just go on as it has in the past, and there's a blindness to history in the sense that a blindness to the fact that all orders are fragile in character. You saw that, as I understand it, um, uh, somewhere uh, 15 years or so ago. You actually predicted that the political system was in for a big shock. Now, it took a little bit longer to happen. So to your credit, I think you were seeing that there was trouble brewing. Well, it, it when, you know, it was, it, when Obama became president, uh, I don't know if you, you know what 
his um, uh, uh, he wanted to transform American politics and um, he framed that not in terms of a new deal or the you know, great society or something along those lines, but in terms of a completely new order. Now, Obama was timid, and he gave one speech at Georgetown, and it didn't get picked up. And he sort of dropped the phrasing. Um, but that was what was intended. And uh, it has become the program of his party which is we must transform the American political order, not make this change here or that change there for a redress of grievances or to cope with some problem that um, uh, had not come up before. That sort of thing has gone on forever, and that's the, the, the agility of democratic institutions is to cope with circumstances that change. No, it was the notion that the order itself was evil. Okay. When you overturn an order, what you get very often is a horror. Um, the man who understood this best was Edmund Burke. Yeah. And he understood. Well, he watched the French Revolution. Yes. Well, but before the. He's thinking it's Cromwell all over again. Yeah. That's what he's thinking. And, you know, in that book that he publishes in 1789, very early, he predicts Napoleon. He lays out where it's going to end. If you take an inherited order and simply overturn it and start from scratch, you will end up with disorder on a scale that will produce, that will, will only end if a Cromwell comes in and puts the cap on things, or if a Napoleon does. The genius of the British system and of the post-revolutionary American system has been the capacity to make adjustments. Yeah, uh, and, without bloodshed. And the conviction that the inherited order is pretty good. Now, this is, um, I want to put this in another frame, a slightly different frame, because I think there's, there's something else going on that's vitally important. Um, and that is, uh, there was one great flaw in the neoliberal world order in the rules-based system, which is that it could be exploited by powers that weren't committed to that system. Under the aegis of the neoliberal liberal global order, you could practice mercantilism. Uh, and at the same time that we've had this transformation of politics that involves entering the silly season in which you reject everything from the past without having any kind of intelligent plan for what to put in its place. Can I interrupt there just for a moment? You say President Obama said we had to transform things. In other words, he wanted to get rid of the order we had. Oh, yes, there's no question. I, I accept that. And you're saying that this is now common amongst elites, that's the push. Yes. They don't have any idea of the end state. Did President Obama have an idea of what he... No. That's a pretty profound thing to say. Yes. You had a President of the United States who gets there under the established order, makes all sorts of oaths and commitments really to maintaining the Republic and yes. all the rest of it, wants to overturn it, doesn't actually believe in it at all, but doesn't have an alternative vision. That's right. It's, it, there's, there's a vision of what's evil which is what is given. That's why I call it nihilism. In other words, there's nothing nihil uh, at the end of the thing. What makes this particularly dangerous, though, is the uh, neoliberal global order is finished. And that has to do with the rise of China. Yeah. Um, I don't mean that part of it can't be salvaged, but that would take a real effort. And there is a kind of blindness. I mean, if someone were to ask me, what do you think of the presidents from the first Bush to today? I would say 
that they bear comparison with Stanley Baldwin as Prime Minister of Great Britain. They averted their gaze from something developing that was a very great threat. And they left us, in effect, disarmed. If it's you were to ask me... isn't it? Hmm? Isn't it called communism? Well, except it's not exactly like the old communism. No, the old communism had one great virtue, and, and that was, that, that was um, uh, their farming system, which didn't work. <laughs> um, mm. Which meant the Soviet Union was, collective farms were a disaster, yeah. and they stuck with it. And the in Ukraine China, was, too. The Ukraine was once a bed brass goat of Europe. It then became pathetically unable to feed itself. That's, it, it's as clear as a bell. Yeah. And China, too. Mm -hmm. and, and the effect of it was that um, they were weak. Yeah. China is much stronger than yeah. the old Soviet Union ever That's was. That's the difference. Yes. But and my, so my point really was, we'd gone to sleep. If we'd known our history again, you right. would have known that communism always demands power. Right. It and always insists that loyalty is given to the party. It can brook no opposition. And it's therefore very dangerous. But we pretended it wasn't. Right. Isn't that really the... Well, there was a dream. If, yeah. if we make them rich, yeah. the middle class will grow up. Yeah. The middle class will assert itself. We also ignored the cultural heritage of Russia, which is autocracy. Yeah. They've really never known anything other than that, except for very brief periods. Mm. And the cultural heritage of China, which is autocracy, and the continued interest in China, existence in China of the old Communist Party that had grown wise in one particular. Mm. They realized that you needed commerce. Um, and so they'd grown much, much stronger. And so year after year from the first bush on, we ignored it. And the United States concentrated its attention on um, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, wasted enormous material wealth on it, and far worse, enormous moral capital on it. Uh, yes. And so there's going to be a tremendous challenge at a time when the elites in the United States don't believe in their own country. Yes. Yeah. And I don't know what the consequences of that will be. One possibility is the silly season will end. They'll wake up and they'll think, oh, we've got to defend this country. Because in the end, they do know that their own well-being was produced by the system that they think in their sort of childish um, self-indulgence that they want to destroy. Uh, can you think of anything worse than defunding the police in major cities where there's high crime? Well, if it's a response to Black Lives Matter, I'd have to say, I would have thought, if you thought it through, you'd realise that the very most common people, or the most common calls for police help, come from black women. Of course. So and it's nuts. Yes, and and this did not come from black Americans. That's my point. Yeah, this was the this very, was, you, you say this you was care a sort of upper people. middle class dream. Yeah, the black people, you know, black or African American women, particularly, I would have thought, the very people we say are subject to violence and racism and all sorts of terrible things. They're the ones most endangered. I, Go figure. Started, or, and then here's the next thing. We, 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 we have a de-incarceration movement, yes. which is sort of close down the prisons and send them out to kill people. And of course they're doing it. And we have practices in New York and in places in California in which um, uh, you can commit a crime and there's no bail. And you can, you can commit a serious crime and there's no bail. And so there's, there's a notion that that which protects persons and property, which is policing the courts, the prisons, is an evil. 
Uh, they don't have any program to put in its place that's going to make policing unnecessary or less necessary. So, well, to pick that point up, I think my broad figures are right. Since I left school in the mid 70s, America's population has roughly doubled, but the mm -hmm. prison population's increased by 750%. Yes. They're nearly all male, but we're not allowed to talk about the boy crisis. Right. And the sort of social factors that are meaning so many, and I say we because we've got the same problem in other Western countries. Sure, I agree. We're not allowed to talk about the dysfunctionality of the environment in which many of them are growing up in. Right. It's the elephant in the room, but we're right. not allowed to talk about the it. The main social problems in this country are not being discussed. And the crucial one is the family. Uh, the, uh, and it, is, it was once largely a black problem. Uh, it is now a universal problem. Uh, I, I have a, a former student, uh, I, I was about to say a young black woman, but she's not that young anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm quite old. It happens to us. Yes, <laughs> yes, it, do, it does. It, we were chatting about this and she was asking, what's Hillsdale County like? And I said, it's the south side of Chicago, but it's white. And then I just, and I said, they don't do cocaine, they do methamphetamines. And she looked at me, she says, it's class, isn't it? And there is a sense, look, when I was growing up, politics turned on class. Class is something substantial and it's not going to go away and it needs attention. Now, in theory, uh, you know, we're in the world of class, race, and gender, except no one really talks about class or does anything about class. And we are, as a country, treating those who are not in the upper middle class abysmally. We're depriving them of their police. We're allowing the schools to go down the tubes. We're hiring teachers who are illiterate. I mean, that's a big part of the story. And because of the power of the teachers' unions, you can't, you can't say anything about that. And we're focusing on our, our attention on who gets to go into the girls' bathroom. Uh, and on, on a critical racial theory that asserts that white supremacy is the main problem, well, there was a time when that's, that was true. And I lived in that time, I lived through it. And it's no longer the case. Black Americans don't like critical racial theory. It's bunk. Uh, they don't like racial categorization. Well, it's bunk, and it does them harm. The great harm. leader Martin Luther King campaigned against that very concept. Right, right. So we've got, and I say nihilism, because there's no rationale behind all of this. There's simply a hatred of the inherited order on the part of people who are rich and self-indulgent in any number of ways. I don't mean just personally, but they're sort of self-indulgent in their politics. It's the silly season and they're following fashion in the silly season. Uh, and it will end one way or another because it will get repudiated at some point. Ordinary Americans aren't gonna put up with this for too long. Uh, it could be that by various tricks, elections can be won for a while. I don't know what's gonna happen in 2022. Well, you run out of money one day. Well, a lot of this is sustained by a lot of money flying around, yes, satiating people who might you know, that, be You know, that's another angry. problem. We have not had a genuinely uh, responsible administration in Washington since Eisenhower. That far back? That far back. Eisenhower paid down the debt of World War II. We had a huge debt at the end of World War II. You can just well, imagine. it was massive. It was uh, the order of 130% of GDP, I think. That's right. And then you turned around on top of that. Truman, to his great credit, borrowed another $13 billion in the money of 1948 for the Marshall Plan. Yes, uh, which Europe would, could not have been reconstructed. Well, yeah. and and, and Truman Truman in. also fought the Korean War, which was very yeah. expensive, and helped reconstruct Japan. That must have cost money as well. Yeah, that was America at its peak, right? Uh, in okay, in of, the aftermath, Eisenhower 
cut budgets. Yeah. And he kept the taxes high. Um, I think he would have been better if he cut the taxes some, because I think the, 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 the take from cutting the taxes would have exceeded the loss from, from uh, uh, what you lose when you cut yeah. taxes. But leave that aside. He did that, and he began paying that debt down. Not to nothing, but to the level where it was inconsequential in terms of um, uh, sustaining the value of the currency. See, what we could have now after um, 70 years, well, not 70 years, 60 years of malfeasance is we could have a currency collapse. Yes. Uh, and what would cause it would be if we cease to be the reserve currency yes. internationally. Yes. I think that is a serious possibility. It is certainly what the Chinese, the Russians, and so forth will try to accomplish. Yes. Uh, and look, the Europeans yes. Your created the euro in Your order. Is very timely. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, you know, I look back. We were profligate. Um, Kennedy was not so bad. From Johnson on, we were profligate. Uh, but no one was as profligate as we are now. Mm. I mean, it's mind-boggling. Yes. And yeah. now we've got the reality you've got to spend a lot of money in the Ukraine. Right. Which is, after COVID, ought to be yet another warning that it's time to put some shots back into the locker to start to put something aside for the next rainy day. Yes. Because and, it'll come. Oh, of course it'll come. It'll come and it will uh, be larger than Ukraine. I think mm. Ukraine is manageable because <laughs> the Russians are the Russians. I. I I can't believe the idiocy of It'd be a bit not, easier. not knowing there'd be resistance. I mean, they're right yeah. next to you. Yeah. Your, your intelligence people can surely tell you everything that's mm. going on in Ukraine. Um, and, they, yeah. and they send in these tanks in the spring where they can't leave the roads or they end yeah. up in the mud. All you have to yeah. do is knock out the first tank and the last tank, and then you can wipe out the rest of them when you please or just starve them to death in between. It, it's, um, but no, there's, there's, um, uh, reality is going to bite. And I think it's going to bite pretty soon. If it doesn't begin biting in 2022, it will bite by 2024. Because um, ordinary people know something is very, very wrong. And, the, 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 the data shows that, doesn't it, really? Oh, yes, and, and, and increasingly. Yeah. The other thing is some of the um, sort of permanent features or semi-permanent features of American politics are beginning to change. I'm not sure that the black vote is safe for the Democrats anymore. And if you've got 20% of African Americans voting Republican, it would just upend everything. And it's mm. very clear that the Hispanic vote is not safe mm. for the Democrats anymore. So let me put it in this way. When I was growing up, the Republican Party was the party of small business and big business. Mm. Democratic Party was the party of the unions and the segregated South. Uh, it, the two parties have really changed. They flipped. Yes, I if mean you look the, at the map of America and the red and the blue. Right, it's reversed. Yes, over the last couple of decades. Yes, and it's it starts with Clinton, yeah. because he's the one who makes an appeal to Hollywood. He's the one who makes an appeal to the uh, hedge fund operators, to the um, uh, to the financial classes, uh, and he was pretty successful yeah. at that. Uh, and uh, the Republicans. Uh, really by dint of, of Donald Trump's acuity with regard to who was aggrieved, uh, have become the working class party. Yeah. They may become the party of the working stiff, not the white working class, but the black working class as well. Uh, that could easily happen uh, because the cities are going to get worse and worse with this defund the police business and with the election of DAs who won't enforce the law. Um, 
it's interesting times. It, Can we round out? Yes. Uh, because you've been very generous with your time, but your understanding of history is very deep. And the Republican experiment here was really about the sanctity of the individual, in, mm -hmm. in one, might be one way of putting it. You know, there was an enormous effort put into trying to ensure that um, government was downstream of culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was driven, of course, by the beliefs of the day. So you could say beliefs shape the culture and values. Sure. They then shape the government and the government was to be kept in its place. Right. Uh, we've, we're reversing that in a big way. Now we're becoming downstream, it seems, of government and its handmaidens, the wealthy elites, uh, and the technocrats or, or mm -hmm. the expertocracy. Um, and it seems to me that this in part has led to this sort of almost suffocating mission creep where government is involved more and more and more and more right. in every aspect of our right. lives. Right, right. And I don't know, A, uh, people seem to almost welcome somebody else making a lot of decisions for them, but B, it's led to an enormous level of cynicism and disengagement at the same time. Right. It's as though oh, over familiarity by a government is bred contempt. Absolutely. And virtually all of our institutions are held in contempt. The percentage of Americans going to college has gone down. Mm. Now, my own view is it ought to go down by about a third. Because uh, I don't have this problem teaching at Hillsdale, but I, I taught at the University of Tulsa for 24 years. And I would say about a third of the entering freshmen there was no purpose in their being in college. They'd be better off with a good trade. Yes, they weren't there to learn. Mm. And uh, I would, I'd give a talk early on when I was young and stroppy at the beginning of term in which I would say, uh, somebody told me the other day that there's some people who come to this university who want a degree but not an education. And I'd say, I can't believe anyone would, would waste money on that. But if there's anyone in the room today, uh, this isn't the class for you, if that's your view. One third would self-identify and drop. One really? third. Really? Yes, and this is a private school, not a public school. Uh, you amaze me. Uh, and uh, I became department chair, and I discovered that the administration judged um, departmental needs on the basis of enrollments, hmm. and that they counted um, uh, anybody who'd been there after the first week is enrolled. And so I stopped giving that talk. And what would happen is they would take the first exam and fail it, and I would never see them again. They would fail the class because they didn't even come, didn't take the other exams. Now, they shouldn't have been there in the first place. And the university was committing a crime in accepting them, they wanted their money. I, that, at, uh, and that's, you know, the, the, the number of 18 year olds in the United States about 15 years ago just dropped off a cliff. The end of uh, the baby boomlet. Uh, the children of the baby boomers eventually finally got married, had children, and then it stopped. Um, so almost every American university is desperate for warm bodies. And that includes famous places like, say, Oberlin College, which I think in the last 10 years has made their class, so to speak, twice. Um, really? Yeah, they just can't, they can't get them to come. Now it's very expensive. And uh, uh, it, it would be very good for the country to downsize higher education. It's just, there's too much of it. And in my time in higher education, um, it, it's gone from being a rather Spartan operation uh, in which the food was not very good um, to being rather luxurious. Um, and most of our universities now are a cross between a country club and a brothel. And that's about all they are. Uh, and you could any, I, I don't think there's a state university in the United States that you couldn't get through without doing reading. I can remember I had a student who transferred into the University of Tulsa from the University of Oklahoma. And I said, what was it like? And she said, well, you could go to class or you could do the reading, but you certainly didn't need to do both. 
So it's been dumbed down. Uh, and the financial pressure of the drop in the number of 18-year-olds um, has caused a further dumbing down. And then there's something else that's going to, to flood this. We used to have, for a considerable period, we had vast numbers of Chinese students. And they paid uh, tuition at the sticker price, no discounts. Mm. So huge money for schools. Um, uh, a, a high proportion of them did not speak English well enough to do things. So you had to have courses they could pass. And it's corrupted higher education in, in a great variety of places. At, at, in East Lansing, Michigan State University, there were whole neighborhoods that were Chinese. Now that's dropped off. So there's going to be an economic crisis in higher education, much greater than what we've seen. There are going to be schools that close, lots of them. It's an opportunity to rethink who should go to college. And it isn't everybody. Uh, and sending everybody to college means college has to be reconfigured as something everybody can do. Um, the other thing is the curricula are terrible. They're things you need to know about your own world, about the world beyond our shores. You can get through without doing any of that. Um, uh, the the um, it could be that the crisis of the neoliberal global order, which we have now entered fully, as it's become visible with the Chinese move into the South China Sea, the the crushing of Taiwan of, of Hong Kong, and uh, the Russian move into Ukraine, it could be that that causes a sobering up. And we, well, we, just have, we have the emergence of responsible statesmanship, which is not what we have right now. Well, we hope it does, and we hope it happens in time. Yes. And the trouble is, um, when you're thinking in military terms, uh, what counts as in time has gotten shorter and shorter. Yes. I mean, it, um, uh, given the fact that, uh, that America was sort of a great aircraft carrier far from everywhere, in, uh, with, with industry. World War II, there could be a gradual buildup. Um, the next time there's a war, it may be over in a week or two weeks. It, um, but it, it's a reminder of what historians know or ought to know, which is that the order that we live in, that we take for granted, is fragile, yeah, and it can just disappear overnight. As people in France learned uh, after 1789, you can wake up one day and it's gone. And then you are in desperate condition. Um, and I hope we don't get that far. Um, it would be a wonderful thing if there was an insurgency with in the Democratic Party against the craziness. It's happened before. Yes. Uh, and it could happen again. Well, Paul, look, you've been very generous with your time. Really appreciate it. And the great thing about what you're doing is that you are equipping, in as much as you get in front of some wonderful young Americans, a cohort of people who may well turn out to be critical to the leadership of tomorrow. So, thank you. It could well happen. Uh, that is certainly our aim at Hillsdale College, and I'm having the time of my life.